Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. Today, we're swinging around back to the West Coast to talk to Chris Bakke about Blades of Cain. Ah, good, good evening, gentlemen. How are we doing? How's your week? It's, it's going. It certainly <laughs> is. It's Sometimes been... that's all we can say. We've got, got a busy weekend with Apocalypse coming up, so. Uh, which Apocalypse is this now? Just, just to make sure I'm tracking on it. 40k Apocalypse. It's like 40k, but then uh, we're going to have Kill Team also be a part of it, because, you know, obviously I run the Kill Team side. So we have basically my shop has like a long standing narrative campaign that at this point is just kind of loosely a rough score tracker for like wins and losses with campaign rules. But every three months there's an apocalypse game. So everyone brings out their big toys. Oh, that's fine. Oh, you, yeah. You're talking about, OK, 40K apocalypse. Yeah, yeah I, I know that one. But like in this one, we're going to have like the Thunderdome. It's going to be a Nurgle Slanesh Thunderdome in the middle that the Kill Team players are doing where they like live, die come back again as fast as possible and every like every like 30 minutes based on the number of kills we're gonna like give buffs out to people that's really fun yeah and i think i'm gonna have like the world explode out from underneath them which you know that should be fun. And, guys... and you know yeah didn't you guys do some sort of uh event where there was like a game that was being live streamed and people would vote on which chaos god would do something and then there were there were changes in the game based on the chaos god was that was that an nyo thing or... No, we weren't able to stream any of the narrative stuff that we've been doing. I think this year we probably will be. I think we're going to be streaming our our corpse of the like our like corpse of the living god boards because we're going to get we have a reaver titan that we're basically like turning into a board set of boards. Well, unless something insane happens, I will be at this NYO. I've been fucking frustrated. I haven't been able to make it before, so I'm super, super stoked for that. I, I, I mean, you you were kind of in the background of the first one. <laughs> I, yeah, flo floating. You can see me in a few frames. Exactly. Uh, I mean, you helped, uh, you know, you helped assemble the uh, goodie bags for all the players at the first one. So, yeah, that, you were that not was, there. That was fun. I was I was there in spirit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I still I still have swag. I'm curious. Is there a date nailed down for the next New York Open? No, we're we're getting pretty close. I've got like a handful of people that I need to finish like convincing that this is a good idea for us to expand out to the other games because it is a lot of extra, it's a lot of extra plates to juggle basically. But once we're, once oh. I have that, then we're going on to the oh, next. So you're thing. planning it, expanding it out from just Kill Team. Mm -hmm. We're gonna oh, expand I, the space. Oh. I think because part of the problem for running these events is if you just run Kill Team, it's kind of hard to make the numbers work. At least, at least from what I found in New York, New York's a New York's a hard place. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Anyways, you know, for anyone who's curious who this is, is uh, Chris Bakke, you know, West Coast, one of West Coast top players for sure. Yeah, I've been around to a few uh, a few events, and I just like playing some kill team. Couple, a couple world championships here and there. He's I mean, been known to kill a team one, one time. There was one <laughs> world championship I was in. Another one I was not just even the one that counts, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it took took third that one. Uh, not not too bad, but Ace and Orion definitely edged me out. And uh, they both been making a habit of that. And I'm looking to try to turn that around this year, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, well, there's plenty of tournaments coming up. We're about to hit like the summer, the summer kickoff. Oh, right? I cannot wait. I'll be at Dallas. I'll be at uh, Tacoma. I'll be at Nova. I'm going to I'm going to be everywhere. Well, I'll see you at Tacoma. I can't wait. And then uh, according to uh, certain people, I've heard whispers of a California gold rush. So Ooh. I'm uh, eagerly looking forward to that as well. I guess a lot of golden tickets are coming to California and I cannot wait. Yeah, I mean, as far as uh, go coming up golden tickets, the Atlantic City Open will have a golden ticket. I will, will be, be running it well. again. I'll have a special FOMO terrain for anyone who's not going. We'll have some custom terrain that I has the, the ACL logo on there. Yeah. So um, very excited. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's uh, like the, the tournament circuit is coming up for this year for all the competitive players. You know, I don't know how many 
Jason and Jason's gonna make it out too, but I know Chris Chris is gonna be making it. Are you gonna be doing it on Blades of Cain? Uh, so I love, I love the Blades of Cain. Uh, they're a really awesome team. I don't know if I'm ready to bring them to a Golden Ticket event, um, but holy moly, are they a fun team to play. They are super fun. Yeah, and obviously for any listeners, we brought Chris on because we wanted to talk a little bit more about Blades of Cain because I think me and Jason are very in love with the Howling Banshee skews. But Chris, you know, he took uh, Blades of Cain out to a tournament pretty recently, and I looked at your roster, you have seven Striking Scorpions, but you don't have... Seven banshees, or like eight banshees. Yeah, so I'm I'm a controversial uh, person on this one. I don't believe in mono banshee. Uh, I I don't understand it, and I have I've run it a few times in some test, you know, uh, practice games, and you know, basically the the way I think about it is in any matchup where mono banshee would have been good, having some dire avengers is even better. Um, and and I know I know shoot me tar and feather me, uh, you know, take me out back and then you know whatever for for sort of liking dire avengers. Uh, but but in a nutshell, my feeling about the team is in order for your opponent's melee operatives to play honest and give your give your own scorpions and banshees a chance, you need dire avengers there to press them and to, to make them not just, you know, take certain positions and to give you the advantage. The problem is that dire avengers are not nearly consistent enough where that's going to work reliably in a lot of matchups. And that's where the team really starts to struggle. Um, and, and so that that in a nutshell is what I think really keeps them out of being a, a contender for top tier play. Yeah, I mean, I found Dire Avengers in all of my games with Blades of Cain to be perfectly acceptable at doing their job. And I think that is totally fine. And then I found Striking Scorpion personally. I haven't super loved them because they just feel like four or five dorks with swords. <laughs> so I was surprised to see that the only skew list you could potentially take was Striking Scorpion. So did you ever actually take Mono Scorpions or was that just like how you built your rocker? I, for that I did not run the, the Mono Scorpions in that event, but Mono Scorpions have a reserved place, uh, especially against Vet Guard and Pathfinders, um, of which I have run those matchups and, and they definitely deliver uh, the business there. And then I've theory crafted that they're going to be just fine into Wormblade as well, although I have not actually put that into practice. Uh, a, a lot of the the what striking scorpions are there to do is to uh, allow me to play against a shooty horde to create a lot of asymmetric scenarios where I can I can attack them and they can't hurt me back. Um, there was a game in a in a tournament uh, a few weeks ago against a blooded player um, where I was sort of sitting behind a door and this was turning point two. And it was actually getting pretty late in turning point two. There were some kills on on both sides and I was pulling slightly ahead and uh, there was this very obnoxious thug sitting pretty close to the doorway. That my opponent was trying to bait me into a situation where if I charged the thug, I could probably get the kill, but I would end up just getting drowned in Ogryn and all the other blooded BS that you, you of course, know that quite well. Um, and so what I did instead was I just uh, I, I ran out from behind the door. I did the, the little mortal wound party, and then I went back behind the door, right, so that my, my operative was completely safe. And I just done some free mortal wounds to the enemy uh, that chip damage. Um, and, you know, in general, I think... Uh, what has made me appreciate Blades a lot is just their ability to really de reliably deliver chip damage and do it safely. I'm also a huge believer in the smokes. Um, I, I absolutely love the smokes. I had a game against a, a Breacher uh, player on Into the Dark uh, over this last tournament for Pacific Skirmish. I didn't take a plasma grenade. Uh, I only took smokes, uh, took two smokes, and they absolutely did work. Uh, Breachers really do not like obscuring. Holy crap. Yeah, I can't argue with uh, ignoring, like, obscuring being important, especially against, like, the shooting teams. And as much as Breachers have their melee operatives, a lot of their damage is done up close with shotguns and, you know, other big guns, right? Yeah, it's it's mostly just Axe, Jack, and the Breacher is the only ones who can reliably uh, deliver melee. Um, and once you sort of zone those operatives out, uh, they start really being uh, struggling for tools to deal with with melee stuff. Uh, scorpions love ITD. Uh, they love the ability, you know, I, I had a, a play where I charged a uh, Scorpion Exarch into a room, killed an enemy in the room, then did the uh, switch to conceal and free dash to get up to a doorway, and then did a hatchway fight for my last action. Uh, getting a tremendous amount of movement, two fight actions, ended up super safe behind a door on conceal after, after the whole thing. Um, so, you know, again, it really comes into finding ways to click the, uh, the aspect in these together to make the, just really lean on that mobility. Uh, one thing that anyone who plays Blades, I think, will observe is that anything that looks at you or, or sneezes at you, your, your operative is going to fall over. Your eight wounds with a four-up save, no invulns, other than the Shimmer Shield, which is a meme. Um, so you really have to, you have to just not take damage and just not get shot, because if dice get rolled, you're going to fall over. Yeah, unfortunately, four-up saves, yeah, sometimes they're okay, but unless you get rerolls because you're forewarned, which means you haven't activated, like, there's a lot of conditions for you getting shot and being like maybe okay 
that yeah, it's probably better to just not get shot. Yeah, and if you're playing in such a way that someone could maybe shoot it there, it's probably not. It's probably pretty far from optimal. Yeah, and, I, I have yet to play forewarned. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about the team that's nice is you have a handful of operatives that can take charges reasonably well, right? If a striking scorpion gets charged and you kill them, you can actually get a free dash, right? Uh, I want to say yeah, it's, I have to check. Actually, I'm almost 100 percent sure it is when you get a kill, you get a dash. I don't think strike. I think strike and fade is the one you're talking about. I don't think you can do that while you're not active. I would have to check, but I think a, oh, yeah. being active. No, it definitely it definitely says uh, after you it, after you're on engage at incapacitant enemy operative that oh, is more well, than three from enemies, you can well, do the dash. Well, there you go. I have used that on guard before, which is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, so like striking scorpions can take a charge okay because sometimes they get a free dash afterwards. Like you get injured, but you're like now you're like out out of position afterwards and you're like all right cool if you mess up the attack step you get a free move and then banshees also are one of the people that could take a charge because you get a free parry yeah ban- well, not a, free parry, but a parry first basically yeah banshees are great at taking charges uh generally the way that i try to layer the team i i almost always run mixed aspects a three through two of some configuration and it's usually banshees in in positions you know somebody's gonna have to take a charge and banshees are the ones i'm gonna have to try to take the charge um yeah it, it's you know if you've played against Blades a few times, you'll definitely learn that uh, unless you stack one of your charges, you cannot afford to send sort of uh, chump models into Blades. Uh, with the combination of just Contempt and getting free movement off of kills makes that very, very dangerous uh, to uh, to send anything other than you know solid melee operatives at them. Yeah, I, I did feel like one of the spots where I found the Howling Banshee, like mono Howling Banshees, to be surprisingly good was actually the six marines just because the power swords ended up mattering quite a bit and you could actually take charges against the five attacks on threes four five marines reasonably well because you can do double parry over two separate operatives you could take two whole separate charges so that's actually a spot where i wasn't expecting it to be good but it ended up being better than expected just because of the ability for the howling banshees to take assault intercessor charges better than they look like they should be able to yeah i just uh, I, I haven't I haven't re- tried running Mono Banshee against Intercessors. Uh, I did find it uh, pretty effective against Phobos and sort of 50-50 against Legionary. Uh, against Intercession, uh, the math really worries me of uh, a durable uh, duelist assault Intercessor running at you. You know, even on the charge, you're not likely to, to be able to get the kill. And if you get charged, you know, you may squeak five damage out before you just get, you know, trampled over. Uh, so the... You know, for me, I'd much rather have the chance of getting some chip damage off, knock those 14 wound beasts down to like 11, 10 wounds, um, and then the Banshees and Scorpions can try to do their job. Yeah, using the Dire Avengers. I have yet to see anyone try to meme and do all Dire Avengers, and I assume that nobody on the West Coast has even attempted such insanity. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't even have the uh, I don't even have the stones for that. I, well, I have three I, of them. So. I don't think I don't think Dire Avengers scale well enough where, where the aspect techniques for Dire Avengers aren't interesting enough where I think the opportunity to double dip on them really means that much. Uh, you know, I, I guess that the joke that I say is, is the best Dire Avenger aspect technique is the tactical ploy to shoot twice. Uh, that, that's that's their best aspect technique, but it costs a CP. And unfortunately, going mono dire doesn't help with that. Uh, I I am now a firm believer in the Shuriken rifle, uh, Dire Avenger Exarch. Uh, I roster him and I ran him against uh, Gallerpox. Uh, I also run him against uh, Cops. And I find in in both situations, being able to just consistently get four hits in um, and then crit spikes, really really valuable in certain matchups. Especially when you give him no cover. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, being yeah. able to just slap for no cover on demand, uh, being able to uh, get the the sort of semi torrent ish on demand is just really really nice. And he shoots uh, twice for free. Cat- shoots twice for free. Yeah, the the Dire Avenger Exarch on the on the rifle build specifically, I think, is not bad. I can't understand any of the other builds, uh, especially the twin ri- the twin rifles, which is just a downgrade. I I, I don't I don't get it. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, I do remember at the World Championships, I was asking the head designer, I was like, why did you do this to this poor operative? <laughs> why yeah, would you make his double gun, the coolest option, so bad? Because it's just like, there's no reason for it. And he even got downgraded from Compendium, because in Compendium, the solo ca- shirk and catapult was four dice on twos, three, four, balance, rending. Now it's 
four dice on two, three, four rending. So it actually lost balance in the, tra- well, in the well, transition. The, yeah, the, the right, all the rifles lost balance, which is a really, you know, I, I don't love that change. Um, and I think the team would actually be in a pretty solid spot just giving them balanced back. But then the I twin think- rifle build has a downgrade to the ballistic skill and a downgrade to crit damage. Where is that coming from? I, I, I don't he's get just, it. He's just not as accurate. You know, he's just yeah. hitting around the eyes instead of directly but on the did, eyes. Did he, did he go to the, like the, the discount, like dollar store shurikens too? Like, is he, is he, is he buying the cheap ammo for that thing? Like, yeah, he's it, loading up generic, generic it, inflation. Inflation when you got twin catapults is really hitting hard or something. I don't know. Yeah. It's a, it's honestly a shame because the shuriken catapult also requires you to take your like dorky melee profile. So then you have to pay for the equipment to push you up to four attacks instead of three well, attacks. Not only do you have to take the equipment to push you up to four attacks, you're still only then hitting on threes. Like you still have like you don't get exarch accuracy out of it either. And it costs an equipment point just to play. Uh, they did fix the thing. We're in Compendium, the Dire Avenger Exarch in that build didn't even have a melee weapon, which I thought was hilarious and didn't get to roll dice in combat. Um, uh, so many very, silly things. So at least he at least he has fists. But it, yeah, it's 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 less than ideal. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely, you know, a, a lot warmer on Dire Avengers than, than other people are. Uh, but my biggest frustration that I see when when people are talking about this team is saying that they'll just die when you charge them or die when you shoot them. Because it's not that that's not true. It's just that there's a lot of teams you could say that about as well. You know, like Corsairs are the same way where they're, you know, eight wounds with a four up save. And if any Corsair gets charged by the Ogryn or or shot at with a fusion pistol, it crumples as well. Right. It's these things aren't unique to blades, um, but with only eight operatives, you need to be really, really crafty at how you position everything and how you use the techniques. Yeah, I I think one of the coolest things about the team is once you can activate all the aspect techniques over the course of the turn. So like your striking scorpion goes in, spits acid at someone, buys time for holding a door so that your opponent has to work around this awkward striking scorpion so that then a howling banshee can jump over a wall into a pile of dudes, kill a dude and then dance over to another person. Like those are the things that you're really looking for, but you have to use 15 extra rules simultaneously and that's part of the fun right yeah i I quite enjoy it um you know on a on a sliding scale from intercession to warp coven they're much closer to warp coven uh this team doesn't hurt my brain quite as much as the wizards do Uh, but it's close you definitely have to keep a lot of things in mind uh and there's a lot of specific triggers to certain techniques you know certain techniques you have to be active uh certain techniques you just need to be involved in a fight uh so you definitely have to keep all of that straight and uh, it's, it's yeah, there's a mental load there. Yeah, some of them you have to be an active operative because like the strike and fade from striking scorpions is interesting because you can do it whenever you get a kill. But yes. the flip side for the howling banshees is you have to be the active operative when you strike with a crit to get your your dash out or your you yeah. know your three inch fallback. So like those triggers are similar because they both involve like you hitting someone really hard and then dashing away. But you, one of them you could do at any time when you get a kill and the other one you can only do when you're active and they call it out. But it's very easy when you're learning the team or when you're in a tournament and there's a lot of mental load for things to kind of like get wibbly wobbly because like striking scorpions and banshees have lots of similar triggers, but they are not quite the same. Yeah, the or like the, the banshee trigger for parry first, they can do it regardless of if they're active or not. But the scorpion stun uh, technique, which I think is the worst technique overall for the entire yeah, team, by far. can only be active. Um, yeah, and I keep explaining to people the number of situations you're the active operative and being able to parry something like that matters is virtually negligible. You have to manufacture a scenario where you don't get bodied anyway, or you wouldn't have killed the guy anyway and just taken one hit. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's probably the worst one. The, uh, the meme move of the, of the recon dash doing one of the gloom is, is, is also very amusing. That's one of my favorite parts of the team. And being yeah. able to uh, gloom twice against Vet Guard or Pathfinder's similar teams uh, is very, very strong. Um, if you played mono striking scorpions you could gloom three times yes uh and and i i have in fact done that and it is as hilarious as advertised yeah so it's two of them because you can double dip on your aspect techniques because you are mono and then it's also one of them because of the scout dash which technically lets you trigger it so that's what lets you do it three times and it's outside of a turning point outside of a turning point yeah so that's if the team had a way of getting multiple dashes yeah i mean it really does uh, 
it, you know, it's it's a it's a funny move. It really does, though, let you put a barricade in a cheeky position that a vantage point can easily see, but you gloom up and like you can take positions a lot of teams can't take. And you do it pretty cheaply because other teams, you know, for example, Hand of the Archon, they have a ploy to give them super conceal. But that's expensive. You don't want to pay a CP for, you know, to, to mitigate maybe one or two shooting attacks. You know, that, that that that's pricey. But this, you're just you're just saying the word gloom and smiling. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to pull off. Yeah, especially with the trend of a lot of competitive players to play a way safer turn one than we were, I think, in the beginning of the game, right? Where turn ones tended to be a little bit bloodier than where we are right now. Yeah, you know, I've noticed the same thing, and I, I can't help but think the sort of the crit ops pack and the way that games often are are sort of like approaching this middle point of both scores tend to be pretty similar, that players are really, really hedging on being able to max their tack ops, which a lot of the time requires, um, you know, not just like turn one to go well, but but all the turns to go well. And the risk you run in a larger tournament is is you do some crazy alpha, and maybe it even works. But if you take some, you know, just some punches in return, you might win the game, but the, the game might end up being low scoring. And then, uh, you know, you end up sort of shooting yourself in the foot for the rest of the event. So it, it makes sense from like a meta perspective. Yeah, I think at the World Championships, it was like a huge thing where all of the alpha striking that I think all the commando players had been practicing and expected to happen basically were stymied by all of the other competitive players on Chaos Cult figure out where to put their barricades to stop the commandos from moving up and lining up behind. I think there was one game where there's an Octarius piece and all of the Chaos Cult models were literally touching the wall fully hidden from line of sight and wall blocking so there's nowhere for the commando player to move their breacher boy into into I attack think, i think i saw that picture and and i mean i can echo that when uh i i played colts for a little bit during hot colt summer i picked them up after their first big nerf um but definitely still back when they were much stronger than they are now and yeah definitely like commandos are a little bit of an existential threat of, of being able to like so many tools just absolutely uh, slam you hard uh, early game and you know, unfortunately, against Colts, you sort of you're forced in that play style of looking for cheeky alpha moves like that because they they play this. You know, time is their friend, and you you don't want to let them play that game. Yeah. So you know, we brought you on because of this SoCal tournament where you took Blades of Cain. You know, there was a lot of good uh, West Coast players there. What? How did you feel like Blades of Cain performed over that tournament? What were your matchups like? And in your one loss, you know. What do you think you could have won that match if you had played a little differently or was it kind of a matchup thing? Yeah, my my lost was actually my favorite game of the event. Um, I played against a gentleman named, named Casey, a lovely, lovely individual. Fantastic game. Uh, I had definitely a series of things that happened during that game that just did not go my way. You know, a bunch of key moves that just didn't pan out uh, on paper. I still think Hand of the Archon uh, doesn't have the flexibility it needs to play into blades and i would give blades generally a favorable time in that matchup overall um so you know i didn't play it perfectly and i had a lot of moves that this didn't pan out um but to the onlookers i think they're very entertained by just a sort of a comedy of of you know i would try these these cheeky techniques and do all these cheeky moves and didn't pan out and then i try some other cheeky thing and made the game really really fun to watch so so uh dakota the to was getting quite the kick out of my pain um so so he uh, he quite enjoyed that um, let's see. My my first game of the event um, was against um, one of the one of the Kelly kids, uh, Malachi. Uh, very you know, very pleasant opponent. Um, he was rather uh, he's a younger player and rather new to Void Dancers. Um, and the nerf newly Void nerf Void Dancers too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was newly nerfed Void Dancers. Uh, the fact that I could bring multiple Dire Avengers uh, just felt like I always had an oppressive shooting threat that they could not ignore. Uh, who cares about your invuln save when I have rending and I never cared anyway. Uh, and then Banshees were absolutely as capable as, as a player in most situations. Um, and, and in some situations, kind of almost better, uh, especially due to how, how much better uh, the, the Blades Fly is. Uh, the second game was the Hand of the Archon loss. Um, the third game, uh, I played against uh, Breachers uh, on End of the Dark and definitely felt like uh, the combination of being able to have crazy mobility, 3 APL, and uh, all these free dashes and smoke grenades uh, gave me a tremendous amount of tempo against Breachers. I also have a ton of experience playing against Breachers. Uh, they're, they're a team that I've played against probably 50 or 60 times at this point. So uh, I knew I knew his team extremely well and also just got lucky for a few initiative rolls that didn't hurt either. Um, yeah, uh, also Breachers hitting on fours and uh, having access to attack order rerolls 
don't like the fact that I can contempt to turn it off. Uh, the, the breachers like to have a couple really power moves, uh, you know, using their breach and clear maneuver or other things, and really, really need their rerolls to be in play through all of it. And being able to contempt on demand was super, super painful. My last game was the game that surprised me the most, and that was against Jimmy Kelly. Uh, he was Geller running. Pox, right? uh, he was running Geller Pox, and I was terrified of this matchup. I uh, I've played against uh, Orion's Geller Pox a number of times. Um, always a great guy to play with, and I really don't like Geller Pox. Uh, coming to this matchup, I felt pretty concerned about it. Uh, I felt that uh, I just they have so much meat, and I have so little meat that just the numbers game will start happening. I can't stop it from happening, and I will just get run over at some point. Uh, I took a Dire Avenger skew build of four total Dire Avengers, including the Dire Avenger Exarch, two Banshees, and two Scorpions. And That's it, pretty hot. Worked, it worked tremendously, tremendously well. Um, the kind of crazy moment of the game happened in Turning Point 1, where I uh, got, a, got a Banshee with a Plasma Grenade and Recon dashed up on Engage, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready. I played against Galar Fox before. I need to hit them hard. I need to hit them early uh, before I just get drowned in Rust Emanations. And so I move this this Howling Banshee up, and Jimmy sees this Howling Banshee, and he's like, there's no way I'm going to let a, a plasma grenade go off in my backfield. I had enough Dire Avengers where he had to deploy suboptimally and where a grenade would, would do work. So he used <clears throat> Recon Dash and Drawn to the Hum to get Volgar up, and he charges Volgar. He gets first activation turning one and charges me, charging the, charges the Banshee with Volgar. He has balance on his melee weapon, but only rolls two hits. Ooh. I immediately nice. pop and tempt. <laughs> Don't even bother parrying first because it doesn't matter. Um, and he realizes that if he doesn't parry me, the Banshees has enough crits uh, to act potentially like knock Volgar down pretty heavily. So he has to parry me. I uh, parry him out. And so I, for my first activation, turning point one, I've got a full health Banshee with a damaged Volgar sitting in front of me, um, which you know, was obviously tremendously lucky for me. Um, and so uh, the, the game from there was a bunch of Dire Avengers running around, uh, shooting hulks with shurikens. Uh, all the Dyers died by the end. Uh, they did not make it, um, but they shot a lot. And I played, I played the shoot twice ploy every single turn. Um, so it was, it was a lovely game. Um, it was really interesting to me how quickly their wounds melted um, because I had a ton of guns that were fairly accurate and had no AP, which was actually exactly fine against Gellerpox. Uh, so, so that really surprised me, um, you know, really not suffering from the lack of AP. Um, and yeah, so, so ended up uh, edging out on that game and uh, was really surprised at how many tools I had uh, through, you know, jumping around with, with Banshees to using the stun move as, as well to get stuns off when I needed to, um, you know, crit when, when a fight wouldn't go my way, uh, you know, uh, just, just really, really, out. More, really more flexible than I thought. Yeah, I actually, when me and Jason were on the Monday stat show looking at kind of like the overhead view of what happened, we we're like, oh, Chris played against Jimmy. That's pretty interesting. Like you won. And the first thing I went to is like, oh, maybe you played the eight Banshees because like with eight Banshees, you have two stun profiles and you've got all the dancing around. So you can use all the small guys to like one shot and move over to the next thing. And if the Hulks charge you, you parry first and maybe you survive. So I was expecting like, oh, maybe that's possible. And then we looked at your roster like, oh, that's not possible at all. Yeah, like all the stun stuff. Like, um, yeah, that was one of the games. Like, <clears throat> I've played the eight Banshees against Gellerpox. And I feel like it's a nightmare for Gellerpox because it's just um, you can you can get there and you can just kill the goons and you can stun the big guys and then they just don't have enough APL to do anything and they can't even like charge and fight you and then like if they do charge someone you can just like another one runs up and fights you just and just back them or, apart. or fight crit dash back yeah you've got so many options yeah you've got like yeah. all the chip damage you can like stun people um and then you can like ju yeah just like crit and jump away and count that as like chip damage and then like all of the little goons can't do anything um and then like with contempt you can just like brazenly charge a hulk um and then just like contempt lock it into one success pair that one success and do like 16 damage because you got two crits and a hit well careful contempt can only be used in a fight where you're not the active operative Oh shit, so, have yeah. I been cheating this whole time? So, yeah, it's hard. Oh, shit. so it's oh, only no. contempt is when you get shot at oh, or somebody fights you. Okay. Uh, I think I might have been cheating this whole time. Well, well but Same. that's that's classic that's classic <laughs> that's classic blades, right? Like 
Jesus. Um, and it makes sense if you think about the ploy. It's like when somebody does something to you, it's like F you to them, right? So it, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, that does it is definitely in there. It says it is not the active operative or shooting attack is made against you. Oh. All right, well, I've definitely been cheating. Uh not that I've played that many Blades of Cain matches, nor have I played in a tournament, so I guess it's all it's all fine and bridge I mean, under the water. To be frank, I think it's stronger anyway, denying a move that your opponent initiated because oh, yeah, yeah. Like, opponent initiated moves are ones that they are banking on more likely to succeed. So I think the ploy is actually stronger as written. I don't find myself yearning for it to work differently. Yeah, um, I, I don't know how often I might have actually cheated, but I definitely have not internalized that part. Of it. <laughs> to be fair, I think I've played like 10 games of Blades. So I doubt it really mattered, um, but mostly because I never wanted to actually bring them to a tournament because the eight like they have the Void Dancer problem, which is you've got eight operatives with eight wounds. So the the band of acceptable play at a tournament is very, very tight. Oh, you, you cannot afford to make a mistake um, with with blades. Uh, it is it is painful. Uh, I, I, although, you know, comparing them to their to their clown brethren, uh, I think Blades is definitely the better team at this point. Um, well, before I, before when, you know, Void Dancer said fly, I probably wouldn't have said it. Now I would maybe make it a 50 50 with, you know, Blades having different strengths that are definitely probably more fun to use right now. I feel like Void Dancers are a little bit too much work right now with how they play. Yeah, I, I'd probably agree with that overall. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I, I think blades are definitely better than people give them credit for. I think a lot of people don't play the team the right way, but they also definitely have the same problem. Void dancers do where they top out at higher levels of competitive play. I mean, there's a reason you, you we haven't seen void dancers win a big tournament in two years, right? Um, no, no, no yeah. disrespect to any void dancers players who have won events that I may not be remembering, but it's definitely hasn't been like a trend. Right? I think, like, I think for the large five plus round tournaments, void dancers might make into the top 10, I think pretty consistently, but they're yeah. pretty much never in striking distance for, or in a very minor sub small, like subset of cases, void dancers are generally not in first, second slot. I believe it happened at Tampa last year. There were two Brooklyn players basically playing for first, second. And I think, you know, it came down to commandos versus void dancers. And, Woof, that matchup. Yeah, back, I don't think that matchup is possible back then. Just a scratch. Yeah, the the pre just a scratch days, it was very different. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the commando nerf helped Void Dancers. I, I, I digress. Um, Blades of Cain definitely have the same problem that uh, the other, their sister eight activation team has. Yeah. I mean, you've been all over the spectrum for teams. You know, we've had a long history of playing together <laughs> across yes, the yes. country. Uh, you have went from Veteran Guard to Blooded to Blades there's of Cain right now. There's a brief you know. Initiate era. There's a brief Hand yeah, of the Archon. Yeah, yeah, true. You did, you did score your ticket to the first World Championships. That definitely happened, regardless of what GW says, with no Vitiates. <laughs> yeah, um, um... Did you do you feel like all of those other experiences have helped prepare you for Blades of Cain in some way? Or do you feel like Blades of Cain has kind of activated a different part of your brain that you're like, oh, look at these tools that I didn't know that I could use? Oh, I, I definitely think everything before definitely contributed toward be, you know being able to, to to drive the Blades of Cain horse effectively. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, God, it's weird to say, I think, ironically, the team that prepared me the most for this team was blooded. Um, they have that a very similar vibe of there's a little bit of shooting that the team has, but that shooting is critical to making the team actually work. And you can't just do the melee thing, at least not most of the time. Um, so I, I would actually argue that that maybe blooded was obviously that like they're very different archetype, very different profiles. Like thematically, the teams are different. This is a hyper mobile team. They're more of like a, you know, click plug and play who's going where. But um, that that general philosophy over the the ranged empowering the melee to work um, definitely I, I got a good hang of that during the blooded days. Yeah, forcing your opponent to keep their heads down because you've got a plasma gunner with their stupid shield in the background. Every time you pop your head out, a plasma gun blows you up. You're like, okay, I gotta avoid that guy. So you gotta keep more dudes on conceal, stick closer to the terrain, and then suddenly an ogre hits two guys yep, yep. when you weren't paying attention. Diabolic bomb goes off somewhere. Yeah, I I got diabolic bombed uh, as blades. Uh, it was me. Yeah, did not did not feel good. I'm like, oh, this is what that feels like. Okay, got it. Yeah, you know, we talked a little bit about Blaze of Cain, the SoCal SoCal area. Obviously, you're in California. California is very different from the East Coast and maybe the Midwest, where traveling is you know traveling out is a little bit different. 
how have you found the West Coast scene grow over time? Because, you know, we've been playing for a long time. Obviously, the East Coast was where a lot of the competitive tournaments were happening for a while. Feels like the West Coast is bringing up a lot more competitive players nowadays. So, uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about the tournament scene and the West Coast, because we do love hearing about other scenes. Right, Jason? Oh, yeah. I would say, you know, three years ago, it was like the Spaniards were really the, the stars of the show. Um, And then East Coast really came to their own, you know, in like, you know, sort of 2022, 2023 era, era, really like KTO. I think that the first KTO and second KTO really, you know, solidified East Coast's dominance. Uh, After that, you know, I really got to give credit and shout out to Dakota, who's been running a tremendous uh, West Coast tournament scene. And I think he has he has definitely done a lot to drive a much higher competitive caliber. Uh, I noticed a sharp difference in this LVO compared to all the previous LVOs with just, you know, the, the, the types of players at mid tables and how strong they all were. Um, so, you know, I, I, the West coast scene has absolutely evolved and developed. Um, of course they're sort of our, our sister group, uh, of, uh, kill team Cascadia up there in the North. I know they're, they're up there, uh, fighting the good fight as well. Um, but there's a ton of really talented West coast players now. Uh, that's a pleasure to play with, uh, even, even a lot more in, in our local scene. Uh, you know, we've got a big local regional, uh, discord for Northern California. There's some, some, a bunch of teams, you know, with team swag starting to pop up around here now. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I'm really excited to is that there's players up in NorCal who can whoop my ass, uh, which I'm very, very excited to have. And so that when I go to a tournament, I have some matchups from like, oh boy, this guy's going to really you know eat my lunch. So really, really excited that all these, all these things have happened. Um, and, you know, shout out to all the, the wonderful TOs and, and team, team captains in the area. Uh, it's just uh, great to see the, the game evolve and, uh, looking forward to the next big West coast versus East coast battle. Yeah, and like, how often are you? Are there tournaments, and like, how many people are showing up? Uh, we're at it. We're running uh, regularly now three tournaments a month. Uh, there's three different like groups that are running tournaments. We got a Sacramento group, an East Bay group, and North Bay group, and and each of those groups is running a tournament every month. And we're now regularly getting ten to thirty people at these tournaments. So so it just varies on you know which exact area. Um, but we're getting a lot of regular play now from a, a ton of different players, which is awesome to see. I know SoCal is driving the same thing where between L.A. and, and San Diego, they have a ton of events going on uh, regularly now, two events a month uh, between smaller and larger events. So, yeah, it's really it's really thriving. You know, Travis, I know we had talked a few years back where we would struggle to put up, you know, once a quarter an eight man tournament. And things have changed a lot since then. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. I mean, part of part of us, me and Jason setting this up to begin with was to catch up with some of these other TOs. So actually, when you brought up the Sacramento group, we actually have a podcast episode with them from last year back when they were doing like six man tournaments. I think they're they've gone up a bit, right? Like you've gone out to their tournaments, too. Yes. Yeah. The the Kadia Fight Club, uh, who uh, who John is, is sort of their ringleader. Uh lovely lovely folks up there uh yeah i try to go once a quarter up to sacramento it's 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 like an hour and a half drive for me so it's it's not uh not just across the street um but it's really really great and they come down to our tournaments as well um so it's really really great seeing the kadia fight club folks and uh they've built quite the scene yeah they're they're putting up they've got regular game nights every week uh they've got a few different uh stores where they run events and they're they're easily consistently now running 16 person events yeah it's super great to hear yeah, no, it's 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 and it gives me more people to play with. I love this game. So I'll, I'll, you know, always happy to see more people grow in the scene. Yeah, one of the fun things that California has, because Dakota is kind of like one of the big ringleaders in the California region. And then up north, you've got Tyler kind of heading up the Pacific Northwest Northwest region, at least in SoCal, because Dakota has the regular squad games, all valley team tournament. There's always a big incentive for teams to get out to SoCal, I think, at, towards the middle end of the year, right? Yeah, it's it's in the like early September time frame. Uh, yeah. So that that actually leads me into a question. Are we going to see Brooklyn Strategist slash Brooklyn Rats coming out to AVTT this year? It's maybe possible. I think it's definitely on the cards right now. My priority is getting the New York Open settled and uh, done along with ACO, Goonhammer Open and all these other like tournaments that are coming up during the summer but i'm definitely not against doing a little bit of traveling this year if the stars align with everyone's schedules just because everyone's got a lot of stuff going on so i want to make it happen i can't recommend the all valley team tournament enough having a um two day like six game event of a team tournament is just so tremendously fun 
uh, it's it's an experience like like no other for Kill Team, um, and it will have a golden ticket this year. So, uh, oh, they're going to give out three golden tickets or just one golden ticket to someone I on the team. I think it's going to be one golden ticket to like the overall top top spot. Um, so that might might lead to some awkward conversations in the car ride home for the winning team of like you know whoever whoever got that ticket. Um, but, uh, no, it, it's going to be, it's going to be a great experience and I'm really, really looking forward to it. And I'd really like to see some East Coast, East Coast folks there. Uh, we had Orion fly out last year, uh, which was really, really great. Um, so I was there the first year. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hoping, yes, yes. Um, so I'm hoping we get both you and the, the plasma spammers out here it would be really, really cool. Yeah. Maybe we'll, maybe I'll try to dr- wrangle up, uh, some of my NorCal friends and I'll just, uh play in a team tournament with them and just yeah, it'll you, just be an excuse for me to come back to california for a bit yeah, you just got to get three it, not not so bad yeah there's a couple dudes up in norcal that help us run this podcast that maybe they'll come down and they'll just they'll just derp around on intercession or something yeah, you'll still have a great time well so that's the thing right you can pick the matchup so you know if, if i'm running blades or something you know just send the intercession at me and watch me sweat that's true. Yeah. Sometimes a stat check is definitely a thing. Or we'll send four custodians against the Blades of Cain. Oh, no. Please, no. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think back at, back when we first, when Corsairs first came out and we were like trying to figure out like, oh, what matchups are like not good. I played against four custodians one time and I was like, oh, no, this, this is not fun. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems really, really painful. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, if, can you imagine getting lined up is... with uh, custodians? Like the four, two five custodies mix with blades of Kane on in the dark. Yeah, but I'm just nope. Don't don't need any of those flashbacks. Oh yeah, dude. I one of the funniest. I think one of the funniest stories I had about the last kill team open was when we were talking about you were on blooded and you were going up into custodies. And you were like, "How bad could it be? It's a compendium team, Travis." And I was like, "We'll see." And then <laughs> oh, like, how like two I hours was. later, I come back and I'm like, "How'd it go, Chris?" You're like, "Couldn't do anything." <laughs> Yeah, there's I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever called, felt quite so helpless as I did that game uh, oh, when man, I, was... I just realized a situation where there's a sister of silence and a, and a custody in a room. And I, I had the Ogren sitting there like full health, ready to go. And I was just like looking at the math and thinking about it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to lose like either of these fights potentially. Like, I don't have anything here. Um, this is my strongest <laughs> melee operative. Oh, no. Yeah. For longtime listeners who have been with us since we interviewed Jimmy Kelly at the last Kill Team Open, that was definitely one of like the highlight stories of that event for me. It was me and Chris, because we have a long history. He comes up, he's like, oh, yeah, I've got custodies coming up. I'm on blooded. And I was like, I don't know, Chris, this is pretty rough. And Chris is thinking, like, is it? <laughs> and then two hours well, later, he's like, I very naive. Because I was thinking to myself, oh, thank God it's into the dark on open. It might have been a problem. But thankfully, there's like doors and stuff to help know. No, yeah. open but to be matter. fair, that was like the big surprise of that tournament. Like, I don't think any of the big competitive players at the time had really thought about that matchup at all. I just had happened to run into it at a tournament the week before, and it turned out that Custodies were kind of like the breakout hit of that Kill Team Open because it was an all in the dark tournament, which definitely skewed what was or was not good. And it was also one of the biggest tournament. I mean, it was the you know, it was a huge tournament. That was fairly recently after the new crit ops update, which True. gave everyone an extra command point. And that's one extra turn of Aegis of the Emperor. And that also definitely made a difference. That That is, you know, the most busted ploy in the game. So, um, <laughs> yeah, wow. Global no crit damage is very, very powerful when a lot of operatives... I think this is also a thing that intercession players who don't ever take tilting shields are missing out on is... There's just a lot of melee matchups where people are expecting one or two crits. And if you never get crit damage ever, a lot of the breakpoints just kind of fall apart on what is considered a good melee operative. Because Corsair yeah, Voids card, they're good melee operatives because they have 4-6 lethal 5. But yeah. if it's 4-4 four, four on 3s, you're like, well, I'm not really doing much. Yeah, that, that, that makes a massive swing. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to a, a glorious uh, summer tournament season. Uh, I've, uh, I'm definitely going to continue playing, playing uh, Blades for some of these, although I've been eyeballing a, a different team that I, I might try to do, be a little more competitive with and see if I can win a Golden with. So we'll, we'll see what Ooh. happens. Well, I guess you're going to keep that one in the back pocket for the time being. Yeah, I might, I might be playing an event tomorrow where we're... Uh, okay, all right. Get. 
Uh, you know, but, uh, how are you feeling? You know, before we head out for the night, I'm actually just really curious. Like, how are you feeling about the meta as it stands right now? Because obviously, by the time this comes out, all of the tier lists have come out, and me and Jason refuse to do any boring tier lists of just rating teams because <laughs> we just haven't done it. You know, where are you feel like the meta is? I feel like higher tech is really good. You know. You, was there a higher tech player at this most recent tournament? Are you scared was, about them there in was general? Not. I am. I am somewhat scared about higher tech in general. That said, I do think the data slate kind of fixed them in a way where it makes them more consistent, but also removed, you know, like defanged that really awful, you know, giant nano mine, um, you know, takes half the board move. Really, really happy to see that severely toned down. No, I, th I think Kill Team is overall in, in the best place it's ever been. Uh, so really, really happy to be playing this meta. Uh, I'm curious how Nightmare teams are going to shake out, but I, I'm sort of feeling that they're not going to be as apocalyptic as people are, are worried they're going to be. I do think that Nemesis Claw is probably the best elite team in the game, but not by much. So, yeah, I think it's going to be okay. One thing I thought was really interesting looking at the tier lists is that people are still ranking Commandos as you know, what they're calling S tier. I don't see it. I think the the Just a Scratch nerf has changed so many matchups for them drastically that Commandos are in a perfectly healthy space now. And I genuinely am not sure what I would consider S tier in the game at this point, which I think is wonderful. I think that's a great, great place for the game to be. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I honestly agree with that pretty, pretty well as well. Um, like a lot of the same kind of wave tops there. Um, I don't think N Nightmare is that apocalyptic. Uh, Nemesis Claw does look really good, but like looking at it from the perspective of other elites, I'm like, I feel like I can play in against Nemesis Claw and not be like completely doomed, <coughs> which is cool. Um, there isn't anything that like super duper jumps out. I'm like, I still think Vet Guard is still really good because I mean, they've just, I don't know, they've hit, they've been rude to me too many times. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, uh, all these tiny little baby taps. I'm like, ah, uh, it needs more. I honestly oh. feel like command, like <laughs> commandos getting placed at high ends of tier lists is a little bit of that where everyone remembers the last probably like basically what was the longest stretch of one team dominance, I think, in kill team history of basically just like almost a full year of commandos just pushing people's faces in. <laughs> So I think there's a little bit of that. I do think that a lot of their media mashups have gotten worse just because there is a lot of crit pushing kind of all over the game, right? Between rending, lethal five on power swords. 1,000%. Oh, and, you know, the Void Dancers matchup is a, is a textbook example of a matchup that was awful for Void Dancers because they could never charge a boy and not have a serious risk of, like, at least taking half health, if not just dying if things yeah. go wrong. And now, you know, they take the rending weapon and, and get a single crit in while they murder Sentra and say they've, they've just one shot the boy and take no damage back. Right. Like that is how massive of a swing. I, I saw people in Discord saying, oh, the Justice Scratch nerf isn't a big deal. It just changes one damage. Like, no, <laughs> no, yeah. it, it swings massive fights. And uh, from playing in a, in a few events since the data slate, all the Commandos players have felt like, have felt the impact. And I have not seen Commandos place well at any of the events. I, I think the other thing that I heard a lot from the Commandos players at the World Championships and elsewhere throughout last year's competitive season is everyone else knows all of your tricks because everybody else has had to play against them so often. So you have to play perfect if you want to do really well. And now that a lot of the top end power for the Commandos has been tapped a little bit, now your opponents still have all those tools, but you have lost those same tools. So now you have to play even, even better. And that that band of like good plays has narrowed down a lot. So I suspect that, you know, they'll definitely drop and they definitely have dropped on the weekly stats. I think this week they were down to like 40%. So it, it might've been good enough. And hopefully the GW balance team doesn't swing back the other way and go say that, Oh, you know, they're down at 40%. Maybe we need to buff them again. Cause like, I don't think we want that. I think it, they're fine. They were fine yeah, they, as a, they, they a never... team. That was fun that everybody had access to. We don't need them to be dominating for the next like three months. Yeah, they would never, like, buff a formerly super oppressive team and give them, like, crazy power uh, to potential. Yeah, it's never happened before, Chris. No, no. No, that no the nightmares happen. will never come back, Chris. It's no, fun. no. <laughs> or sometimes you become the nightmare. Yes, you'll assume you'll, you'll don the Batman headpiece and go dunk people with your Vox screams.
Yeah, you know, it's it's like again, Vox Scream, it's spooky, terrifying, but Omni Scramble's been in the game. And I know it's not the same as Omni Scramble. I know it's different, but Omni Scramble's been in the game since Phobos, and it's annoying, but you can work around it. Yeah. I think I think I'm pretty excited to look at where the meta is going to be over the next couple months. Especially because it doesn't seem like we'll have a new release. But a lot of the tournaments are coming up right now, so it's like a stable ish meta while the while the events are going so we'll we'll get the we'll get a fun time yeah oh, oh definitely i mean uh you know the that tournament i was just in pacific skirmish had a compendium guard take the first spot with scouts taking second and a hand of the archon in third right like pretty good that's yeah. not a meta blown and this is an event with stacked with some really talented players uh, and i even showed up too right so it, like that's really um <laughs> <laughs> so so you know it was it was a great event yeah, I, I yeah, I think the meta is in a good spot. I just uh, put my base coats on my higher tech circle. I don't know when I'm going to get a chance to play them because I never get to play in anything because I'm always running them. So. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm excited to give them a try because I have all three of the cryptex, too, because I was like, yeah, why not? Where do you fall on the rights of reanimation debate? Uh, I think it's pretty firmly in that the Technomancer gets all three abilities. Like they were pretty clear about striking the first paragraph, which is the thing that you choose. So I think it is just an ability. And I think enough of the TO, I, it seems like, um, a lot of the TOs kind of are on the same page. I, I could see, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, if I went to a tournament and someone told me that that was not the case, I would be fine with it. Like, I don't think that's how it's played, and I'm not going to run it that way at my tournaments, but I can respect another TO's decision in those situations, you know? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, right, I, I don't think it makes a huge difference because I still don't know if Technomancer even makes the cut. Uh, but um, I say he's on a 50 millimeter base. Let him have fun, right? Like, <laughs> what what are we doing here? Agreed. He's a big... Yeah. He's a big boy. If yeah. like the big goal was the big... internal balance, <clears throat> then you've got to like you can't just like poop on him every time he tries to like come up and enjoy <laughs> some sunshine. Yeah, and poor poor psychomancers is still in the corner crying, but maybe maybe one day he'll have his day. I don't know. You know, if you if, it sounds like you haven't listened to the podcast ever, which is totally fine. But at least in the Midwest, there has been a psychomancer player just terrorizing Jason's local meta. Yeah, he's been. Oh, I, he's been. <clears throat> bringing the psychomancer out and uh wrecking everybody's day and he's been doing that for a long time well i i am i would love to play against that and i'm not saying the psychomancer has no play uh however it's really hard to not just look at that five up feel no pain and plus three inches of movement and not just consider that an auto take spell every single game and i i really struggle to not see how you wouldn't just take that and the nano mine still but I would I would love to see otherwise. And a great player can win with a lot of teams, right? So Yeah, I think it's definitely a case of it's not rawly as powerful as those abilities, but because you get different strengths with the Psychomancer, you can make those strengths work in a hand like in a variety of situations. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, and it goes back to the theme theme of what we've been talking about, right? Like Blades of Cane, really fun, super flexible and can place a lot higher than the stats would suggest. Yeah, and like but talk- they may still hit a wall. Yeah, we talked about like um, th- how much it messes you up to not be able to score crits at all, and like that's one of the psychomancer's big things as well. Yeah, it's a big bubble of no crit damage, and it's just straight up like no crits. So like a melta gun, then your crits well, I, just like lose them. Like I've I've played against him before. Yeah, I I uh, the the experience I had was that yes, that's an incredibly strong ability, but in order to use that ability, the psychomancer has to be really close to the action. And, like, you can find a way to deliver 13 damage, um, even without crits. And that's been my experience. Now, your mileage may vary, and certainly, you know, I'm, I'm definitely ready to play against an opponent who can make me eat those words. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and it sounds like with the West Coast on the resurgence, eventually you're probably going to run into some higher tech players. I've got some locals who are eyeballing them. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, they took, you know, they, they took the Midwest by storm. Hopefully we'll see some some good results on the West Coast and we'll have some other stuff to talk about because, you know, we've got our Monday stat show where we've been covering the week to week undulations of the meta. And actually, surprise, surprise, this last last weekend, Chris, Blooded had a 70 percent win rate. Yeah, I, I think I think Blooded are one of the strongest teams in the game uh, at this point. Uh, I would I would definitely agree with that. Uh, the 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 rest of the meta has been continually getting chipped away at while they're just sitting there collecting blooded tokens. Yeah, I I that does not surprise me in the slightest. 
but you played them enough where you're kind of like taking a break, right? I, it would take a lot to make me play blooded again. Uh, the, I, I, I can't, I can't play another team that only can do seek and destroy. That that just, can't just it, it's, seek it's, and destroy it's, one more it's time. Not really, really boring. Um, oh look, you played bloodbath. How exciting! You know, well, you I, know. I, luckily, luckily for you, with nightmare, if nightmare is a trend, we're probably just going to see you know every team releasing with three or four tech updates. Yeah, jeez. Um, yeah, that's definitely one of my big complaints about Nightmare is that both teams have access to three of the four tack up decks, kind of removing the point of having the distinction at all. Yeah, I think the game's at its best when a team has two tack up uh, archetypes. I think that that's a healthy spot. I'm glad Blades were designed that way. I think the game's, you know, I think that's I think that's better. I just wish more teams had infiltrate, and I'll just continue to. I bitched about this before. Why don't Blood and infiltrate? I don't know if I'd take it, but just. Why is why isn't it an option? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm probably probably not going back to blooded or cults for a long time. Uh, they're just very they have very repetitive play patterns, and I want to take a break from that. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Anything else you want to talk about? Any upcoming tournaments in the Bay Area or other shout outs for teammates or you know what's what's going on? Yeah, what big else? shout out to the, uh, the Bay Area Championships coming up on Memorial Day weekend. That is the 25th and 26th. Uh, that should be the largest uh, tournament we've uh, run up in NorCal ever for Kill Team. Uh, sort of a uh, side tournament to the Bay Area Open, which is not happening for Kill Team this year. Um, so if you are uh, in uh, on the West Coast, want to come out to a really killer tournament, uh, join me for Memorial Day weekend uh, up sort of near Sacramento and Vacaville uh, for the uh, Bay Area Championships. Can't wait to and see. And we'll, of uh, course, there. have links in the show notes to make sure that shows up. And, you know, for anyone listening on YouTube, hopefully uh, this will come out before <laughs> before then. You could get tickets if you're in the I, area. I sure hope so. We have a month. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, have a wonderful evening and uh, looking forward to playing some more with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. And thank you, listeners, for listening until the end.